Good morning. Today begins a three Sunday, three week sermon series called A Better Way, Love Stories and Languages. For those of you that are more newer in February, I like to play and focus on God's love, agape love. And so this is the third year of kind of ending up in that same space. Today the sermonic theme is the power of words. The power of words. There was this girl who could sing. You all know some can hold a tune and some can sing. But there's a special category for others who can sing. And this girl, let me tell you, she could sing. And so she would sing in the shower, she would sing around the house, she would sing while working and with her friends and at school. Because this girl could really sing. And one day her mom, a single parent, came home tired to the bones after a long day of work, frustrated, irritable, and wanting just a little bit of quiet. After a long day of work with people, she had enough problems, sounds, and grime. She wanted just a little bit of quiet, and that's when she heard her daughter singing. And without thinking in that instance, she yelled, please, please, please shut up that noise. Well, her daughter did get quiet. She added some flavor about her singing abilities, the mom. And the daughter did her one better. And just like that, the girl who could sing stopped. There's a saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I believe these words were born in the hood and born in struggle, born in places where the sun finds it hard to shine. Born in the midst of heartache and pain, this phrase was given to people who needed to armor themselves in battle, who had something to come back even if they had nothing in their pockets. Wikipedia says these words are used as a defense to name calling and verbal bullying intended to increase resiliency, to declare, bring it on, to let others know, in the words of MC Hammer, you ain't the only one that can't be touched. But I believe when you have to say something doesn't hurt you, it does hurt. No matter how good you look, no matter how bad you play it off. It's like the draft at a door when the temperature gets down to the single digits. It gets through. Mean words find us in the valley. The Memphis Police Scorpion unit ain't got nothing on the hunt down of unkind words. And at the very wrong time, as if there is a right time, Words can slap you blue. The girl stopped singing. This is where we dip our feet in the pool of God's word. The Pharisees found a woman having sex with a married man. We don't know her story or his story. We got pieces, but the puzzle isn't complete. The what had happened, the what did happen, and the what would happen, there's some pieces missing to this puzzle, but they say more that the more folks don't know what, the more they talk. And so people try to put the puzzle together anyhow with the pieces missing. Make it make sense. We don't know if there was some forever for always for love kind of thing going on here. We don't know if this was mutual reciprocity kind of love going on. We don't know if this was some kind of I want to rock with you all night kind of love. We don't know if this was some kind of love some same kind of love. We don't know if this was some kind of Romeo and Julio kind of love. We don't know if this was some kind of she keeps me warm kind of love. We don't know if this was some kind of don't lose your head kind of love. What we do know is their thing was interrupted by the Pharisees that had a point to make with Jesus. We know that there were two in the bed, but how often it goes down, the men drag the woman before Jesus. What we do know is that the Pharisees crossed over the threshold, making what was done in private more public, propping up this unknown woman for the purpose of making a point. The law already stated that this act was punishable by stoning. They wanted to see what would Jesus do, but they needed a pawn, and so it was easier to grab a woman without rights than to take the man, take them both. They stood without regard for her humanity right in front of everyone, and using her as a pawn, they asked Jesus, what would you do, Jesus? What would you do? 
At first, Jesus says nothing. He's down on the ground, writing in the sound. He's quiet, and so not at all moved by the plank in their own eyes, they continue on insisting a second time. They want Jesus to answer their question, what would Jesus do? It's the question maybe we ask when we get in a tight position. What would Jesus do? Maybe you got your own set of questions for Jesus. How would Jesus handle this situation that I find myself in? But their question was not tilted toward wanting to know or wanting to grow. It was aimed at taking our Lord and Savior out. And he had to know this. He had to know that he wasn't on their favorite list. And so he pauses for a bit, takes in the air and releases it, takes in some more hair and exhales. This is like the game of chess when you're losing and you don't realize it. And when you finally does, he responds, wait for it. If any of you are perfect, don't wait on me. Go ahead and stone this woman. You could hear a pin drop. By the way, how many folks here today are perfect? Go ahead, raise your hand and get them up in the air. Denise, Maurice, okay, all righty. I need to meet with y'all Monday. <laughs> Maybe you all didn't hear me. Well, Denise and Maurice did. How many of you believe you are perfect? Let me revise the question. How many of you believe you're close to perfect? Stop playing. Seriously, some of you have been going to church for a long, long time, and you haven't rolled up to perfect yet? One last time, I'm going to give you. Marisa, I'm going to raise my hand again. <laughs> Turns out, none of the Pharisees gathered there were perfect either because one by one they walk away until only Jesus and the woman were left. It's easy to focus on what someone else ain't doing and forget just how imperfect we are. It's easy to gossip about what someone else isn't doing until we get a good look in the mirror at ourselves. It's easy to leave grace and mercy when it's needed in our own lives. It's easy to throw another human being under the bus, but what does that say about us? It's easy to point the finger at others, but the wise saying says one points back at us. So easy, says the scripture, to see our siblings' imperfection and miss the plank in our own eye. It turns out we are all imperfect. No more talking. The good old boys, they're gone. Jesus looks up. He looks at the lady. Now he's asking the question, where are the men? Where are the self-righteous? Where are the ones who look down on others? Where are the ones who have to build themselves up by putting others down? Where are the ones who in their own arrogance brought you here in the first place? Has no one condemned you? Has no one picked up a stone? The lady responds, no one. And Jesus says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. In 2002 translation, go and live your best life. Like Olivia over there. Write a new chapter. Kick up your heels. Do your thing. Be victorious. You have a second chance. Make the most of it. Girl, guy, you're free. And she whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. This month we're going to talk about love languages. The first love language is words of affirmation. Words are powerful. Somebody ought to say amen. Wise Solomon said the tongue has the power of what? Life and death. Mark Twain said I can live for two months on a good compliment. Notice somebody's haircut. Notice somebody's new shoes or their outfit. Appreciate a good deed that somebody's done. Appreciate that someone's trying. Appreciate a quality in a person that you like. Just noticing a person at all communicates that they matter. Words of affirmation encourage us to take bold steps we otherwise wouldn't take. 
It works best when we all participate. We can't have one-way streets. And though words of affirmation may not be your language, the thought of those words coming out of your mouth may feel ridiculous. I don't do that. But it may be someone else's language that you care about. And the object of our love is doing something for the well-being of others. I have attended a few funerals this year, and one thing I noticed in particular, and I just want to get your thoughts on it too, is how well people talk about people when they're dead. I mean, beautiful words, beautiful, beautiful words. You would almost think that these people were perfect sometimes. The span of each person's life so eloquently covered by selected folks on the program. When we attend funerals, we all get to know a person a little bit better. But I have always wondered, listening to those beautiful words, those beautiful, beautiful words that come out, those beautiful words that death make us speak, did the p dead person know just how we felt about them? Did they know they were all that to us? Have we shared how we really feel about each other to each other? Have we told our loved ones just how much we love them? Have we used this language of love to communicate just how much we love each other without reservation? Make sure you, your posse knows what you think of them before they die and what they think of you. Not only is the, it is the language that we want to speak, but what do we want to hear ourselves? What are we thirsty to hear others speak to us? Now again, words of affirmation is not everybody's love language, but for sure, you really can't go wrong with love. One of the things love languages teaches us that often we speak what we're comfortable with instead of speaking the language that that person receives. So for some people, words of affirmation are like H2O, they are like a parched plant that gets water and perks up. Jesus used his words in this text and other to liberate, forgive, and affirm this woman's worth in the text today. He uses his words to break down walls and reach heart. Jesus used words to heal and help. He didn't minor in what she was doing wrong, but he majored in the life that was before her. He opens the door with his words to a new possibility. Maybe no one ever said that to this lady before never came to her rescue attempting to set her free. Get out of here, woman. Go live your best life. No persecution here. On parent tests, host Allie Wentworth and parenting expert Dr. Adolph Brown explore different parenting styles from helicopter to child-led by putting 12 families under the microscope in the ultimate parenting stress test and sharing what they learned. In season one, episode one, they give each parent the task of trying to get their kids to jump off a high diving board. Most kids are like, nope, not me, not today. And then come these two dads with their two sons. Right away, the boys, when they look up and see the diving board come on, on wow, that's pretty high. You can see fear entering them and grab hold of them. Once up in the air, the kids express their doubt about this whole thing, I'm, I'm just not sure. The kids are like, I think, I think I'm going to pass on this one. But the dads communicate to each of the children, while you do not have to jump off the board, consider it a challenge. And sometimes challenges could be fun and sometimes a crazy thing to do. They both seem like they're still not sure about this. One of the dads is down in the water and one is sitting up high on the diving board with the sons. The oldest son finally jumps off. He's done it. He is so pleased with himself. But that youngest little kid, he's like, he's doing all kind of movements, like trying to pull on some superhero power. The dad lets him know, son, you don't have to do it, and each of us are made different. And the son is like, dad, I need a moment of silence. And then the words of affirmation come that help this younger brother. They come from his older brother, who's already down in the water, who took the dive. He yells up, just believe in yourself. Just believe in yourself. 
And with those words spoken, the little brother runs and jumps off the diving board. Because words of affirmation, they feed us, they nourish us, they move us, and they encourage us. Words of affirmation give us the strength we might not otherwise have, push us, and sometimes they allow us to take that leap of faith. Amen.